Today's travels have brought us to Earthick Hall, a grand estate house located in Wales in the County Wrexham. This building next to the car park gives you an inkling of what we're going to see. It looks to be a folly or maybe a dovecote. We are visiting the estate in the midst of the Autumn Apple Festival. Over 100 varieties of apples are grown on the grounds. We make our way toward the home through the sawmill and workshops area, where several large pieces have been carved into the shape of apples. Earthick Hall got its start over 300 years ago in 1684, when the newly appointed High Sheriff of Devonshire, a man named Joshua Edisbury, began construction of a lavish house worthy of his status in society on this beautiful site a mile south of the town of Wrexham in the year 1684, the result of which was a large rectangular home that was nine bays wide. The home was here long before the automobile, and extensive stables housed an abundance of tack, harnesses, and animals used in the service of the home. As the 20th century arrived, so did automobiles. Animals began to give way to machines. Horse stalls became garages for automobiles. However, Edisbury's thirst for the finer things in life eventually outpaced his wallet because 25 years later, his funds ran dry in the face of mounting debt. He was bankrupt by 1709, which relieved him of his stately home. We are now in the servants' quarters, which occupy the bottom floor of the home. It was in these areas that a small army of servants and staff lived and worked behind the scenes to attend to the family's needs and to the basic affairs of the household. Here, food was prepared, clothing and linens washed, pots, pans, and dishes scrubbed, and the domestic affairs of the household were kept in good order. Mr. John Meller, a wealthy London lawyer, acquired the home from the bankrupt Edisbury. Meller set about furnishing his new home with some of the best things that money could buy. He also added the north and south ends of the home and doubled its size, and lived there comfortably for the next 24 years until he died in 1733. Meller left the home to his nephew, Simon York, which began 240 consecutive years of the York family living in the home. Simon York did little to the home itself, but he did take interest in and develop the gardens over the next 34 years. When Simon died in 1767, the home passed to his son, Philip York. Philip made many changes to Earthick. He added the saloon and library. He refaced the front of the home in stone, added a kitchen, offices, and a stable yard, plus added many new furnishings and wall coverings to the interior. Philip enjoyed the home for the next 37 years until he died in 1804. The house passed to his son, Simon, who was named after his grandfather. This is the estate manager's office, where estate business was attended to. Take a look at this, an early foot-powered vacuum cleaner. Very clever. The housekeeper's office, the housekeeper was in charge of all female staff. Judging from what's in here, this area appears to be for the groundkeepers.
Take a look at the staff dining area. While not as posh as upstairs, it is far from being a dungeon. While they certainly worked hard to take care of the family, they ate well together in their part of the house and socialized among themselves during their off time. For guests and family alike, living in this house during its heyday must have been more like staying in a fine hotel. Formal, multi-course meals were served by waitstaff at dinner time. Wardrobes were stocked with freshly cleaned and pressed clothing. Beds were made, linens changed, and rooms cleaned by dedicated maids and servants. All of which did their best to stay out of the view of the family. All one needed to do is ring a bell, and a member of the staff would appear and be at one's beck and call. After Simon inherited the home, he threw frequent parties, which prompted him to add a large dining room to better entertain. He also installed a then cutting edge underfloor heating system and a servant bell system. When Simon died, the home went to his eldest son, also named Simon. This Simon expanded and added to the park and gardens. He also created a music room in the entrance hall, as well as moved the front entrance to the tribe's room. He lived in the home until he died in 1894. At the time of Simon's death, it was the dawn of the 20th century. And with that new century came governmental, political, and social changes. Changes that made it more difficult for large estates to generate the funds needed to maintain their homes, their grounds, and their extensive workforce. It was the beginning of the end for many large estate homes all over the United Kingdom. So, Simon's son, Philip, inherited the estate in 1894 under less than ideal conditions. Philip struggled to preserve the house and its contents with a diminishing staff. He died in 1922, and the home went to his son, Simon, named in honor of several grandfathers. But Simon was just 19 years old when he acquired the financially struggling estate. He became a recluse and lived in the home without electricity or telephone. Throughout this period, the house declined. He may have been a bit of a hoarder because Simon parted with nothing and all remained intact within the home. To make matters worse, an old coal mine under the house collapsed, placing the building's foundation in jeopardy. When Simon died, the home went to his brother, Philip York. Philip had few options. He negotiated with the National Trust, which took ownership of the estate in 1973, thus ending 240 consecutive years of ownership by the York family. We have just exited the home on the lower floor out into the back garden. You can see the original Nine Bay home in the center, as well as the two wings added to the left and right. That was added by the second owner, John Meller, in the early 1700s. A beautiful view of this Victorian garden that stretches 1,000 feet out to the east. There would have been several full-time groundskeepers to keep this all looking so nicely manicured. Take a look at all these apples.
114 varieties. They weren't kidding when they said over 100 varieties. Now out into the herb and vegetable garden. We are back at the workshops area and the weather has improved. The visit to Earthic was absolutely worth the time. In fact, we could have spent a good bit more time there. But the day is winding down and it is time to head back home. Remember, life is a journey. Enjoy the ride and thanks for watching.